Well, praise the Lord. It's good to worship the Lord in song and appreciate the, uh, the excitement of your singing. It's always a blessing. When I was a boy, we used to hang out our laundry. We didn't air out our dirty laundry. It was the clean laundry. We stuck it out to dry. And it was this thin little, you know, just a three sixteenths quarter an inch line. And you'd throw some quilts and some blue jeans on it. It'd start to sag down and the bottoms of your blue jeans would get grass stains on them. And so we had this pole. It was a nice length, you know, with a little notch at the top. You'd stick it on the string and you'd poke it up in the middle. And that's what Wednesday night church is to me. I start to kind of droop in the middle. It's nice to be around God's people, and it's a good pick-me-up. I want to make sure everyone has a copy of tonight's worksheet, number 162, Offended Because of Jesus. And um, I don't want you to be offended this evening, but I want you to have a copy. So if you don't have one, raise your hand, and we'll get you one. Does anyone need one? All right, excellent. Well, I'd like for you to take the Word of God and open it, if you would, to Matthew 26. As we saw last week, Jesus met with the disciples in an upper room to celebrate the Passover. And in Exodus 24, Moses takes the blood of the sacrifices and he puts the blood in these basins. The one basin of blood he pours onto the altar and the other basin he takes and he sprinkles it onto the people saying, quote, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. And that blood of the Old Covenant or the Old Testament was what was ordained at that moment. But in the last Passover, some people would call it the Last Supper. We would call it the institution of the Lord's Supper, though it's all of those things. Jesus uh, creates this new feast and celebrates with his disciples. And he appropriates the words of Moses when he says, for this, taking the cup, is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now, this is the new covenant into which his people are entering. That's Matthew 26, verse 28. Here's your first bullet point. Jesus has told his disciples that he is the lamb. That's the blank, the word lamb. And his blood will be shed to do away with the sins of his people once and for all. Now, we understand we are not sprinkled with the literal blood of Jesus, and we do not drink the literal blood of Jesus at the Lord's Supper. It is the obedience of Jesus unto death, even the bloody death of the cross, that secures our soul. That is what secures our salvation. The blood is and always has been a signifier of the type of violent death that Jesus would die. And he's committed to this, this new covenant that Jesus is making with his church, his New Testament, new covenant people is better than the covenant God made with Adam because it promises a new heaven and a new earth that cannot be tainted with sin. The new covenant that Jesus makes with his people is better than the old covenant that God made through Moses and uh, in the Old Testament, because it promises not just laws, but a new heart to know and love the Lord in every way. The new feast Jesus gives to us is better. It is better than the old feast because we have Christ and all of the old point to the real. And that is Christ, the last Adam, the true Adam the one who redeems his people from their sins with his own blood. Now, Matthew, for all of his love of Christ's teaching, on purpose leaves out a very beautiful and significant sermon by Jesus. If you want to study it, it's, it's taking place right here in the text we're looking at. But write this down somewhere in your notes. I didn't give it to you because your page was already getting a little crowded, and I didn't know how to do this briefly. In, in fact... Put a marker in Matthew 26, and let's go to John 13 together. I'd like to show you this speech, because where and how it happens is important. And the amount of time that John, the beloved disciple, gives to this 
is really significant. We're going to look at Jesus prophesying the, the failure of Peter tonight. And you'll notice that chapter 13 of John ends with this, what we're looking at. And then as Jesus tells Peter in John 13, verse 38, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. We go right from there into John chapter 14, where Jesus begins to teach his disciples that a comforter is coming, the Holy Spirit. And Jesus speaks about the ministry of the Spirit in John 14, John 15, and John chapter 16. And when we get to uh, John chapter 14, the last verse, verse 31, Jesus says, Arise, let us go hence. So the picture that John is giving to us is that they're sitting at the Last Supper. They're having this conversation. Jesus says, let's get up, let's go, and they walk. When they get to the brook Kidron, the end of John 16, Jesus stops and he stands there and he prays this high priestly prayer where he intercedes for his people. All of John 17 is Jesus praying for you. And at the end, John 18, verse 1, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where was a garden, into the which he entered and his disciples. So all this is taking place, all of this conversation, all of this sermon. And Matthew has kind of marked, I was a little surprised, I'm always a little surprised to see this not in the book of Matthew, because Matthew marks out the life of Jesus by his sermons, you know. But this one was not in the Holy Spirit's mind to put in Matthew's letter. And that's okay. We still have it. It's been preserved for us perfectly and beautifully. And you can read it and learn and grow from it if you want to do that. Now, if you were to read Matthew's gospel, which we're going to do, our text is Matthew 26, verses 31 through 35. You could get the idea that the event in our text takes place at the Mount of Olives. But even here, and this is your second bullet point, Matthew 26, verse 36, reveals that this happens sometime between dinner and the garden. And so he doesn't pinpoint the timing as exactly as John does, but there is no contradiction. Sometime between dinner and Christ's prayer in the garden, he has this interaction with Peter, and uh, we're thankful that we have it because it's really informative for us. Well, let's read our text, Matthew 26. Verses 31 through 35. Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. But after I am risen, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. This is the word of the Lord. Let's bow for prayer. Father, bless us now and teach us from your word. Encourage our hearts, and may we be helped. We're thankful for the reality that these disciples would all be offended because of you, for it was written that this would occur. And Lord, so it's written that we also will fall seven times. But by faith, with the power of your Spirit, with your help, we can rise again. Lord, teach us tonight that failure is not final. That there is something to be gained and learned and we can even be helped through the realization of our weakness and our need for your assistance. Father, I pray that you'd give us humility. Remove from us pride. Forgive me for my failings today. And bless us as we look at your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, to introduce what Jesus is saying here, I'm going to start with number one, and it's in your 
your notes. Number one, the certainty of the prophetic word. Jesus says, all ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. So I want to consider as we look at this phrase of Jesus first, what does it mean to be offended? And then secondly, we'll look at uh, where this is written and exactly what it means. All right. So here's firstly, your first bullet point under number one, the word offended is a translation of the word scandalizo. Does that sound familiar? Scandalizo. What does that sound like? Sounds like scandal. You can, the blank there is scandalize. Scandalize is a transliteration. That is, it's just bringing those sounds over into our language. Now, your next bullet point. There is a wealth of meaning in this word scandalizo. It's used a lot of different ways. And uh, I'll put a I'll times out real, here, real quick here. The word scandalize has shifted somewhat in our day to day. And so it's, it's not exactly, it doesn't mean exactly in our common vernacular what it used to mean. All right, so back to your bullet point. There's a wealth of meaning in this word scandalizo, but it generally has to do with being caused to stumble. The idea is that there is a trap or a snare set. And what Jesus is saying to his disciples is that there's going to be a trap set for your feet and you're going to be caught in it. There's going to be a snare. There's going to be something in your path, in the way of your faith walk, and you're going to trip over it. You're going to be given a reason to stumble and you will stumble. Here's your next bullet point. The disciples will be offended, that is made to stumble, because of Jesus. It's important to note, this does not mean that Jesus will do anything wrong. Jesus is not saying that he's going to do something wrong. So what does it mean? Well, right into your next bullet point. It means that the course of action that the Father has prescribed for Jesus will take him into great temptation. And that temptation is not his alone. That's your blank there in that bullet point, the word alone. Because this is not their first temptation. This is not the first temptation that Jesus Christ has entered into with the disciples with him. Neither is it going to be their last, but it will be the last with his earthly presence with them. Jesus tells his disciples, and it's in your notes, Luke 22, verse 28. Jesus says, ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations. Jesus says that to his disciples. He went through a myriad of temptations during his lifetime. It wasn't simply the temptation by Satan in the wilderness. That was the most severe. That was the most powerful. But that was not the only one. Even in the garden, he's going to be tempted. And uh, all throughout his lifetime. But the difference between Christ and other people is that Christ always stood. He never fell. He never stumbled. He never questioned what was the right thing. And what's the wrong thing? He knew the right thing. And he uh, also never wanted to do the wrong thing. He always wanted to do the right thing. And he always chose the right thing, which makes him significantly different from us. But Christ was never offended in this sense. He never stumbled. He never tripped up. He never made a bad choice. He never looked back at something with regret. Some people think that being offended just means to be angry about something. And a lot of times we use it that way. They'll say, well, so-and-so... You know, they got offended because somebody said something bad about their casserole, and so they've never been back to church because they were offended. Well, that's not the idea behind this biblical word, offense. I listened to a sermon several weeks ago, and I'd heard this particular message before, but I'd heard it from a different man. And I was listening to this man parroting another man, and he said uh, about his particular um, culturally relevant position, he said that, you know, this is the word of God. This is the word of God. He said, if you don't like it, or if you're angry with me for saying it, if you're offended, he said, it's because you don't love the Bible. Because the Bible says, great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. That's Psalm 119, verse 165. Well, I don't doubt that Psalm 119, verse 165 is true. 
But I also think that being angry does not necessarily mean that you are offended. Uh, this man was angry that uh, women wore pants. That's what he was mad about. So he was offended at that, I guess, <laughs> to use that logic. If Jesus was offended or angry when he, when he threw people out of the temple, well, then he was upset or angry. If that means being offended, it would mean he didn't have great peace and he didn't love the word of God. This is a logical fallacy. It's an indefensible position. It is, uh, it's not right. Let me give you your next bullet point. Psalm 119 verse 165 says that people who love the law of the Lord, who love the law of the Lord, find security for their souls in the fact that they will not be tripped up in their faith walk. It doesn't mean that they'll never be upset about anything. Good grief, there's plenty to be upset about and to be rightly upset about in the world. Have you ever seen injustice? No? Have you ever seen injustice? Uh, and it, if it doesn't bother you, it's like, what kind of animal are you? You know, you're a sick beast if you're not bothered by injustice. I mean, so the reality is, is that offense, biblically, when we speak about an offense, we speak about someone who is following Christ and a trip or a trap or a snare is set for their feet. They step in it, they trip, they stumble, and they stop following Christ. It's a dangerous thing. It's a scary thing. It's a scary place to be. You know, an unsaved man might have the seed land in his heart and it sprouts up, but he's in thorny soil, he's in shallow soil, and a fence comes and he says, boy, I'm done with this Jesus stuff, and he goes away. What's going to happen to that man's soul? This is a dangerous thing. Uh, here's the reality. Every one of us are imperfect creatures. And so our walk with Christ is going to be imperfect because our love for the Bible is going to be imperfect. The reality is, if our love for God and His Word were perfect, our faith walk would be perfect. It would be perfect. But our love is not perfect. The reality is, is that we're prone to human weakness. Solomon talks about this kind of stumbling. I've given you two verses in your notes, Proverbs 25, verse 26. He says, a righteous man falling down before the wicked is as a troubled fountain in a corrupt spring. And I think we could agree with that. A righteous man tripping, stumbling in his faith walk before the wicked gives them uh, much cause to despise God. And we see that in our day when a Christian falls or a Christian stumbles or turns their back on the God they claim to love. But here's the reality. Proverbs 24, verse 16. And this is the blessing. This is the beauty of being a righteous or a just man. Solomon says, For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. Jesus says, all of you disciples are going to fall. You're all going to trip. You're all going to stumble. You're all going to fall because of Jesus. Now, Jesus would stand, but he would stand alone because each of the disciples were going to fall into the traps or snares that Satan had set for them. Here's your next bullet point. What would Jesus do that would cause them to be led into snares set by the devil? You're going to be offended because of me, he says. Well, here's what it is. It is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. Now, this is written in Zechariah chapter 13. In fact, if you want to put a marker here and uh, find that, the I in this statement is the Lord speaking about his doing the smiting. It's right before Malachi, if you can find it, which is right before Matthew. In Zechariah chapter 13, you'll notice the first six chapters are very messianic. Verse 1, In that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David, 
and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. So this is talking about the fountain of Christ's blood being opened, his uh, uh, substitutionary death. He goes through this in verse 6. One shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? Then he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. This is obviously speaking about the death Jesus was going to die. And then you look at verse 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn mine hand upon the little ones. So there's a reality here that God is going to smite the shepherd, the good shepherd, the great shepherd, the chief shepherd. God is going to smite his own son. The wrath of God will be poured out on Christ on the cross. And in your bullet point, you have Zechariah 13, verse 7, and the blank is the word smite. Smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. This is the plan of God. And it's going to disappoint the disciples. It goes against their expectations. I'm going to be very plain. Often, God's plan goes against our expectations. Often, what God does defies what we want. And that's okay, right? He's allowed to do that. He's allowed to do something other than what I hope. He's allowed and what happens? Well, often I step into a snare that Satan's set for me. I step into a trap that's been set for me. Now, I want to be plain, and we'll get into this a little bit. It's not like the disciples couldn't have known what was going to happen. Jesus had been so plain. But as we'll see with Peter, it just wasn't clicking with them, right? But also, it was written. It was written. There's really no getting around it. It's going to happen. It is the plan of God for Jesus to be taken, tried, beaten, killed, and buried. It is written. But it wasn't the disciples' plans. Still didn't dissuade them at all. Um, they, you'll look and see. They're like, not me. Not me. And Jesus said, it's written in the Bible. And they're like, yeah, but that ain't about me. That's somebody else it's talking about, right? Uh and had their love for the word of the Lord been more perfect, perhaps they wouldn't have been offended. But I don't think that's really the issue. Um, I, I don't think it's unfair to chastise the disciples. I think it would be unfair to say, boy, if they'd have been more what they ought to have been, like me, they wouldn't have stumbled. <sighs> it's written, Jesus said. This is how it's going to go down. Here's your bullet point. The smiting of Christ, the good, great, and chief shepherd of the sheep, as well as the scattering of the flock, which is the eleven, and others, it was ordained long before Jesus selected these men. Long before. And if we look at them, sit in condemnation and say, boy, if they'd have been more what they ought to be, then this wouldn't have happened. That is to take the very same perspective that the disciples take. Well, I'm right, and I'm walking right, and I'm okay. Don't worry. It's going to be fine with me. It's unrealistic. It's easy to assume that we have everything together. It's easy to sit in judgment over others. It's easy to say, sure, the 12 forsook Jesus, but I wouldn't have done that. I would have died. But then we sound just like Peter, don't we? And we miss the point. We miss what Jesus is teaching his disciples when we do that. Christ's point is when the rooster before the rooster crowed twice peter was going to have denied him three times that's jesus's point jesus point is not peter this is avoidable you know it's a choose your own adventure book and if you zig instead of zag if you spend a little more time praying instead of sleeping you'll be fine that's not what he's saying he's saying peter you're going to deny me three times tonight. That's a hard pill to swallow. Could you imagine if Jesus came to you and said, before this night is over, you'll have cursed me three times. 
I'd say, not me. Not me. I love Jesus too much. I know what he's done. I know what he's done in my home. I know what he's done. In my, well, not me. <laughs> I used to not like Peter. And then I realized he's, I'm just like him. And that's probably why. Reality is we're not looking. Jesus isn't trying to show him how to escape the failure. He's telling him the failure is going to come. The issue here is this. Here's your next bullet point. The disciples needed to be humbled because they were proud. Because they were proud. Not me. You know, and in the upper room, we see a little glimmer of hope. Will it be me? Will it be me? And then out here, we see that pride kicking up again. I'd never do that. I would never do that. Listen, friend, when you say, I would never, Satan sees an invitation to set a snare and set a trap. I'm no prophet, but I can say on the authority of God's word that there are times of trial there are inescapable trials coming your way. And it may have to do with family, health, career, wealth, friends, education, who knows what else. There are inescapable trials coming your way. By God's grace, the Holy Spirit is with you. He can empower you to escape every single one. You won't escape every single one. You're not perfect. You're not Jesus. You're going to stumble. You're going to trip. Well, what do we do? I'll get to that. First, let's look at what we don't do. Here's number two. The confidence of the disciples. The confidence of the disciples. We see an attitude in them that I think Jesus is trying to work out of them. And... Uh, Peter obviously feels this is too much. I think he was expecting a Joel Osteen message. I think he was expecting Jesus to go, this is my Bible and what it says I can do and, and all this stuff, you know, and get some power of positive thinking going on. Uh, and Jesus is just, you know, negative Nelly here. And it's just too much to be born. How dare you say that I'll do it? And Peter looks at Jesus and he says, in effect, you have no say over what I will or what I won't do. And that's a scary place to be. In fact, you can be sure that a stumble is coming up when you look at Jesus and say, you don't have any say over what I do or what I don't do. There's only one escape from our temptations, and it's the one Jesus gives us, right? So if we look away from Jesus to find an escape, we are not going to find it. Here's your bullet point. It's really interesting because out of all that Jesus says, and the blank there is the number 42. There are 42 words in English. Peter gets hung up after eight words, right? He says, uh, let's look at our, our text. All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. And Peter says, I will not be offended because of you. Peter hears, all you will be offended because of me this night. And you could just see the gears going. What? What? Not. And all this other stuff, he just absolutely misses. Jesus is encouraging his disciples. Their failure is not final. As believers, there's going to be hope. They're going to rise up again as righteous men. And he points them to the truth of Scripture. Here's your bullet point. Here's the problem. Peter has transitioned into self-defense mode. And there may not be a dangerous place for a Christian to be because self-defense mode always comes from a place of pride. Now, I think we ought to be willing to defend the Lord and maybe even to defend our testimony at times. There's wisdom in that. But put a marker here. And we're doing a lot of flipping around today in our Bibles, but that's okay. Go to Job, if you would. I want to show you this. This wonderful story of Job. In all of his trials, the Bible says he sinned not with his mouth. He never charged God foolishly. This is an amazing testimony for someone who went through as much as Job did. But after his miserable counselors came around and, and false accusations began to fly, he starts to defend himself. 
Look at Job 23, verse 3. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, and he's speaking of God, that I might come even to his seat. I would order my cause before him and fill my mouth with argument. I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say unto me. Will he plead against me with his great power? No, but he would put strength in me. Do you hear the confidence in his voice? Well, if he knew where he could find this God guy and lay out all of his arguments and say, listen, this and this and this, and you're not thinking about this and you haven't considered this, and he has all of his ducks in a row, if I could just make my case to God, he would have nothing to say against it. He would defend me. Look at Job 38. Job is beginning to think that he could manipulate God to his will. That's a scary thing, isn't it? He says, there's nothing God could say against the arguments I have in my mind. He has an airtight case that he wants to present to the Lord. But then the Lord shows up. And the Lord answers Job in chapter 38 out of the whirlwind. Look at verse 2. He says, who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? And then the Lord just goes on for a while. Where were you when I did all this? Just who do you think you are? Mr. Big Stuff, right? And Job drops his self-defense. And this is what's really most telling. Go to chapter 42. He admits what a fool he was to question the Lord in his ways. And in Job 42, verse 1, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I'll demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself, I despise myself, and repent in dust and ashes. And the Job of chapter 42 is very different from the Job of of 38. Very different. He goes from self-defense mode to self-despising mode. He goes from self-love and self-worth to this attitude of humility. And it is a right perspective, right? Job isn't off course now. He's back on course. This exact process Job went through is the same process through which the apostles must go. They have to travel this road. Because pride is built into their nature. Their heart is deceitful by nature. It has to be corrected. And the good shepherd is leading them into paths of righteousness. And this is the path every child of God must travel. Every child of God must learn to know and love their Savior. And look... There's mistakes on that path. There's failure on that path. None of us follow Christ perfectly. And here's what we don't do. Firstly, it's your bullet point. The top of the back page. Firstly, Peter was overconfident in his strength. In his strength. His first refutation of the words of Christ, though all men shall be offended of thee, yet will I never be offended. Uh, This is interesting because it's a direct attack on the other guy standing there. There are ten men with Peter. Jesus says, all of you, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And Peter goes, all men, but not me. I'm in a class alone. Here's your next bullet point under firstly. He believed he was stronger than his brethren, but he also believed he was stronger than his own sinful flesh. This is the flesh speaking because the flesh denies the word of Christ and the flesh always speaks foolishness. 
He says further, though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. And listen, the flesh never goes willingly to death. Never. A.W. Tozer teaches us that very well in his books. It must be crucified. The flesh must be dragged to the tree and pierced. It must be dragged to the altar and bound and slain. The flesh does not go easy. Anyone who's ever told their flesh no knows that. Here's your next bullet point. The flesh will never carry itself to a cross. Peter's pride and confidence in his own strength is misplaced because the flesh never relinquishes its own strength. It's a tyrant, and tyrants never let go of power, and that is what the flesh is. All right, secondly, Peter was overconfident in his wisdom. Jesus, who is wiser than all, tells Peter, you're going to fall. The wisest of all, God himself in the flesh, says you're going to fall. Here's your bullet point. Peter believes he's stronger than his brethren and wiser than Jesus. And isn't it a blessing that Jesus has Peter there to correct him, to uh, fix his misinformation? He says, oh, Jesus, you have some fake news. It's, that's not how it's going to go. You know about these guys, but just keep your eyes on me. I will surprise you. I'll shock you. I'm not like the rest of these guys. When I prayed my pastoral prayer on the first Sunday of this year, I prayed specifically for two things for wisdom and for courage because those things come from the Lord not from the flesh and we need in order to follow God we need wisdom so we can know what his will is and we need courage strength to actually do it and that's what Peter needed and he's denying the source of wisdom and strength uh, in order to claim his wisdom and strength and as a pastor I often counsel proud people And you can show someone in the Word of God what Jesus says and what they need. And so often when someone's life is falling apart, they have this perspective that they're smarter, that they're stronger than God. And the truth is that we aren't. You know the first beatitude? When Jesus speaks about coming into His kingdom, it's your bullet point. Blessed are the poor in spirit. This is why the first beatitude is a blessing on those who have spiritual poverty, spiritual humility. God calls His people to trust Him with childlike faith, with simplicity. Here's your bullet point, your next one. The beginning of every successful spiritual journey is spiritual humility. Humility. That is poverty of spirit that recognizes it has nothing to offer to God. But God has everything to offer to us. Would you go to 1 Corinthians 1? This may be the last one that I have you turn to. I think this is the last one. The Apostle Paul teaches us the gospel is so beautiful because it's the great equalizer of all men. As we compare ourselves among ourselves, we start saying, well, I'm smarter than this person, I'm smarter than that person, I'm smarter than that person. And I may even surround myself by people that I'm smarter than. I might avoid people who are smarter than me. And I could get the impression that I'm pretty smart. I do the same thing with strength, with wisdom. I can do the same thing with morality, righteousness. I could do that because I compare myself with others. But the gospel is the great equalizer. Let's read 1 Corinthians 1, 22-31. For the Jews require a sign... And the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to nothing, to naught, things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him, 
are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Oh, what is Peter learning here? He's learning this. Let him that glorieth, glorieth, glory in the Lord. Here's your bullet point. Compared to the wisdom and strength of God, we are all weak fools. All of us are weak fools. So where do we get wisdom and strength? And to those of us who are saved, Christ is the wisdom of God. Christ is the power of God. Here's your final bullet point under number two. By his work, Christ has become all wisdom and power to God's people. Peter and the rest of these 11, they're men of faith, but their faith is still small. It still has to grow. Like the rest of us, they have a lot of growing until their confidence in self is small and their confidence in Christ is big. But there's some encouragement here. Because Jesus is not telling them this because he wants to wipe them out, right? This isn't the end. Why is he telling them this? There's a, there's a reason. Here's your third point. The care of the Savior. There's the certainty of the prophetic message, the confidence of the disciples, and there's the care of the Savior. We can see this in quite a few different ways, but I'll probably just look at two main ones. Firstly, by the message of Jesus in the first place. If their downfall were his goal, he didn't have to tell them anything. If their failure were the goal of Christ, he could have just kept his lips shut. But the very fact that he's saying, tonight you will fail me, implies to us that he is not planning for their downfall, but he has some better thing. The ultimate goal of Christ for his disciples, is their faith and their success. One thing I'd love for you to do after we finish with this tonight is go home and read at least John 17 and see that the same Jesus who tells Peter, I know what you are about to do because it's been prophesied, it's going to happen. I know what's about to happen. That same Jesus Praise on their behalf that their souls would be secured, right? He's not out to get them. Secondly, we see Jesus carrying the words that the disciples ignored. Here's your first bullet point under number three. Jesus said, after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Now, we know the disciples missed this initially because after his resurrection, an angel tells the women in Matthew 28, verse 7, Go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. Lo, I have told you. And it's like, why would they have to remind them? Well, Peter was busy defending himself, and he missed this good news. Peter, you're going to fail, but I'm not, is what Jesus is saying. And Peter's like, I ain't going to fail. You know, he misses the thrilling, exciting, important part. He misses the part that will save him from his failure. He misses it. Here's your bullet point. Mark 16, verse 7 says that the angel reminds Peter specifically by saying, tell his disciples and Peter that Jesus goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him as he said unto you. And I don't know if this was tongue-in-cheek. It certainly could have, could have been. Remember, like he said, I don't think the angel was talking that way. But there's a truth here. It's your next bullet point. Peter's faith deficit caused him to miss the joy of what Jesus was saying to him. I will die, but I will rise again. You will fall, but because I rose again, you will rise again. Just as the prophetic word says you will fall, the prophetic word also says I will go before you into Galilee. Peter, I'll see you in Galilee. Hey, you're going to mess up big time. You're going to make a big mistake. Not me, not me. Don't worry. I'll meet you in Galilee when it's over. This is a great thing. 
Here's your bullet point. The one who prophesied their fall was also preparing for their rising again. And the word is preparing. That's the blank there. The Puritan Richard Sibbs wrote what's one of my favorite books outside of the Bible. It's called The Bruised Reed. And in that book, he likens our failures and our foibles to the bruised reed in Isaiah's prophecy where uh, it says the bruised reed he will not break. And Brother Sibbs teaches us that, that God allows bruising in his church so that we will remember we are weak things. We're doves among the fowls, a vine among the plants, a bride and not the groom, a sheep and not the beasts, a reed and not an oak. But God also allows these bruisings. He allows us to be bruised like a reed to show our union with the one who was bruised for our transgressions. The disciple is not above the master. But the joy of this bruising a bruised reed, Isaiah says, God will not break. And so many of us know what that bruising is like. We know what that failing is like. We know what it's like to look in the mirror and not like the person we see. We know what it's like to look at the past with regret. Here's the joy, though, at your next bullet point. God allows these things into our lives not to destroy us, but to strengthen us. He humbles us by them. By the bruising, we're not broken forever, but we're taught to cast ourselves on the Lord's mercy. And it is a mercy to recognize our own weakness. It is a mercy. Here's your next bullet point. When we are bruised, we learn our strength is not in us, but in God who raises the dead. This is part of the new covenant sealed in the blood of Jesus. The Apostle Paul speaks to the New Testament church. And he teaches them that there's going to be these sorts of scenarios. But what it is, it is the work of God in the lives of his people. And here's how he works through the church. Look at this in 2 Timothy 2, verses 22 through 26. In your notes, flee also youthful lusts. This is to the elder of the church. But follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strives. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Now we'll pause right here. You can mark where we're at on the page with your finger. Peter is opposing himself. He is opposing his own good. Wouldn't it have been wonderful if he said, Lord, I, I don't want to, but if you say it, it's true. What, what should I do? Jesus says, after I'm risen again, find me in Galilee. Peter could have been, you know, Johnny on the spot. He opposed his own good. He withstood God's best for him by his own strength. Let's go on. And the, the servant of the Lord must be gentle like Christ, apt to teach, like Christ, patient, like Christ, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, like Christ, if God, perhaps, or peradventure, will give them, these are those who are opposing their own good, God, peradventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Failure isn't the end. Perhaps, the Apostle Paul says, God will give them repentance to acknowledge the truth. Perhaps he won't. There are Judases still. That's, that's a tragedy. There are Judases still. Perhaps he will. He certainly did with Peter. He certainly did with the eleven. The shepherd was smitten, and all the flock was scattered abroad. They went into hiding after the death of Jesus. Every one of them went into hiding after the death of Jesus. Here's your bullet point. 
Every disciple fled, denied, or doubted. But when Jesus arose, he was gentle with them. He was gentle. The shepherd rose from the dead and gathered the flock again. They heard his voice. They came to him. In patient love, he came and he taught them. And God gave them repentance. And that was their testimony. None of these men could realistically be proud after this, could they? This is a death blow to the pride. And what a joy it is. Their testimony after this was, I'm a sinner and Jesus loves me. (laughs) I remember Roy Thompson in the last few months before he passed away, uh, we had him in to speak. I think we were one of the last 10 churches or so that he came in to speak when we were up in Stowe. And he came through and he knew he was dying. And he kept saying, the Lord loved me and washed me in his own blood. And he'd open his text, he'd read his text, he'd read some scripture and he'd start crying. He'd go, Jesus loved me and washed me in his own blood. And he just said it over and over and over. At the end of life, that's what's going to matter. That's what matters. After Christ's resurrection, that's what mattered to these men. None of them could preach their own goodness. None of them could preach their own strength. None of them could preach their own wisdom. They proclaimed the wisdom and the strength of God in the gospel. And I think there are men and women here who can give the same testimony. We've gone down that road. Some of us, I'm sure, have more to go and much more to learn. But we can say, I failed Jesus And he's never failed me. I've made big mistakes. He's always been faithful to me. It's good to know the Lord, isn't it? Here's your bullet point. There were times our best intentions were no match for the trials we faced. And we tripped, stumbled, fell, and hurt ourselves and others. But God was gracious. The teachers he gave us were gentle. And we received the blessing of repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Nothing can be gained by denying this. Confess it. Confess to the glory of God and the goodness of Jesus Christ. Confess to the gentleness of Jesus Christ that He pursues sinners and He loves them. He redeems us. He saves us from our sin. It's a wonderful thing. Here's your last bullet point. We are helped and the helpers of others when we admit this truth and proclaim God's faithful goodness in the midst of our failures.